Today we're going to talk about mapping reducibility, but before we do that, we need to talk about computable functions. So we let's just say that we have a function f right here, which is going from takes arbitrary strings to arbitrary strings. So this could be technically any function. And we say that this thing is going to be computable or Turing computable, some people usually call it, um, if there is some Turing machine, let's call it M, and uh, for all W, uh, uh, M, uh, compu uh, I should not say computes, M will take uh, w as input and write f of w on the tape. Okay, so this thing is computable if the Turing machine can eventually write it out onto the tape and it, it, we might as well assume that it stops at this point. But computable is just a natural thing. It's like a computer program. Can you actually compute this thing? Then it's computable. So like if I wanted to compute n squared, then I would just take the input w right here, think of it as a binary number and square it. We can easily do that on the computer, so therefore it's computable. So uh, we're only talking about computable functions here. And uh, what is mapping reducible then? So let's say that we have two languages, A and B. So these can be just any arbitrary languages. And we're going to write uh, A less than or equal to M, B. So the M is means mapping reducible. The less than equal sign in most computer science in this area actually means reducing or reduction of some kind. It's a reduction. So this thing is what is called a mapping reduction because of what I'm going to say next. But sometimes whenever you talk about complexity theory, you deal with polynomial time reductions and then there you would put a P here or a log space reduction and then you would put an L here. But here is just a mapping reducible uh, thing. And so what, what does it mean to be mapping reducible? So if we're going to say that this is true, if there is a computable function, so remember what the definition of computable function is, is it can write it out on the tape. So some Turing machine can write it out. Let's call it F, which again goes from sigma star to sigma star. It does not not have to just take inputs from A or produce things that are in B, but there is a certain relationship between A and B. So if there, and not if, such that, so if there's a function f such that the following property holds, that w in A, where w is just some arbitrary string, if and only if f of w is in B. Okay, so in this sense, the answer of whether the string w is in A is exactly the same thing as whether the produced value, the computed value, is in B. So uh, as, an, as an example, we uh, actually saw the following reduction, atm less than or equal to m, etm complement. And why is this? In the proof that ETM is undecidable, we actually, what we did is we made a Turing machine and uh, had the pro it had the property that its language was empty if and only if the Turing machine M did not accept W. So we had to invert the answer there. So here it was actually a reduction from ATM to ETM complement because we produce that Turing machine that corresponds to the complement of ETM. Uh, so there are some other properties that we're going to show, namely this one. So, so here's a little theorem that we'll show here, which is that if A, oops, 
less than or equal to m, so mapping reduces to b, and b is decidable, then a. a is also decidable. So uh, I don't even need to write out the proof for this because it's actually very, very straightforward. So the reduction says that there is a function that takes inputs, uh, any old input, and produces any output, where the original input is in A if and only if the produced value is in B. So let's think about this. Actually, I'll write it out, um, but I don't really need to. So let's look at this. W is in A if and only if the produced value is in B. That's the definition of mapping reduction. So let's let's look at this. If B is decidable, then look, look at what happens. So if we get some arbitrary input W, and I do not know whether it's an A, I compute the F of W value, it's computable, so it takes only a finite amount of time to produce this F of W value, then I feed it to de the decider for B. And then from that, look at what this is saying. Whatever the answer of whether it's in B is, is exactly the same answer as it is in A. So that means that uh, uh, we can actually decide A because if I had no idea how to decide A before, I just figured, run it through the B decider and the answer is exactly the same because of this mapping reduction um, right here. So if there wasn't a mapping reduction, I can't really say anything, but because there is, we're able to say something right there. So this actually tells us something interesting that if etm complement were decidable, then atm would be. And actually that's the reason why etm is undecidable, because if it were decidable, then atm would be, but atm, as we all know, is undecidable at this point. So uh, another thing that you can prove, and I'm not going to do, is if A is undecidable, then B is undecidable. Because if not, the, if B were really decidable and A was decidable, this thing would contradict that. So if A is undecidable, then B is undecidable. If B is undecidable, that does not imply anything about A. And if A is decidable, that doesn't imply anything about B. So make sure to get the direction right. That's the most important thing with reductions, getting the direction right. So hopefully that was interesting. Leave your thoughts about mapping reductions down in the comments down below. As always, please like the video and subscribe to the channel. It really helps us out. There are many other links in the video description if you want to support the channel further. And as always, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.